All right, guys, question of the day. Happy Friday. Let's make it a fun one. Is homosexuality natural? Yeah, let's talk about homosexuality because it seems that a lot of conservatives shy away from that topic now. Plus, I'll be giving my thoughts on Hayden and Penetier's recent Red Table Talk interview and why I think that Vladimir Klitschko is the real hero of the story. All that and more today on Candace Owens. All right, guys, before we continue, I want to take a quick second to talk to you about Birch Gold. In this unpredictable economy, it is extremely important to protect your savings from big government and big banks, and you can do that by diversifying into gold. What does that mean exactly? Well, if a major crisis hits and your retirement savings are only placed in paper assets like the dollar, you might see your portfolio rapidly diminish in value. Diversifying into assets like gold, which have tangible value and applications beyond just investment, increases the likelihood that your savings worth is protected. And it's worth noting that the value of gold often tends to increase even when other assets are in decline. Birch Gold Group helps you hold gold and silver in a tax-sheltered retirement account, which protects you from big government tyranny. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, countless five-star reviews, and thousands of satisfied customers. So text Candice to 989898, and Birch Gold will send you a free info kit on diversifying into gold tax-free. Take the necessary steps to hedge against inflation today and protect your hard-earned money Get your free info kit by texting Candace to 989898 now. All right, guys, so it's true. I am perpetually asked this question. Candace, where do you stand on homosexuality? Why does it seem like conservatives are now avoiding that topic? It seems as if conservatives have given up on the homosexual debate altogether. And we now just talk about transgenderism. Also, another thing that people say to me often, people that are from the LGBTQRSIV community, they say to me, Candace, I hope your son grows up to be gay. Or I hope your son grows up to be trans. I think they mean it as an insult when they say these things. It's meant to harm me, but that kind of gives me an idea of what they view about gay and trans people, that they are launching it as almost an insult. So anyways, now it is true we have landed upon the T in our society. What began, of course, what preceded it was the L, the G, and the B. And I want to talk about this because there are some statistics that feel a little bit impossible to me, okay? So a Gallup poll found that today 7.1% of adults in the United States identify as either lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, or something other than straight or heterosexual. Now, 7.1% today But in 2012, 10 years ago, that number was 3.5%. So what changed? How how did we more than double the amount of adults that identify as LBGTQ or something other than heterosexual since 2012? That, That just feels a little bit impossible to me. Now, I wanted to talk about this topic in terms of some recent experience that I had that really challenged me to think about it in a different way. So first and foremost, a few years ago, it it seemed a little bit innocuous at the time, but now it has a lot more meaning. I was walking down the street in Washington, D.C. There is a lot, especially in inner cities, you know this, and people will say, because if you're gay or lesbian, you move to an inner city because you will be more accepted. There's more people, obviously. But in D.C., there is a high presence, particularly along 14th Street, of lesbian and gay people, and they're out, and there's a lot of rainbow flags. And I was walking down the street with an immigrant, a person that was from Eastern Europe and was visiting the United States, and they asked me this question very seriously. They said, Candace, why are there so many gay people in America? And I sort of laughed because it was just such, I don't know, the audacity of the question, but also because of how sincere the individual was being when they asked it. It wasn't said from this stance of homophobia. There was no fear of gay people, but they're just asking like, hey, actually, why are there so many? And I didn't answer their question in a meaningful way, but they then said to me, well, we just don't have this many gay people in Eastern Europe. We just, we just don't have this many people. And I thought, Like, you're probably thinking, oh, well, it's probably just cultural differences. 
maybe you actually do have that many gay people and you just don't realize it because they're scared to come out, right? That's the idea. They're trembling in a closet everywhere else but in America because we've become open and we've become accepting. Now, Eastern Europe is not Saudi Arabia. You're not going to get thrown off of buildings for being gay. Um, and yet, this person was telling me that this seemed bizarre to them, that there were this many people waving rainbow flags, this many gay couples walking down the street. That conversation stayed with me. A second conversation, and this is probably the most interesting conversation that I have ever had about the LGBTQ plus community, it was with a gay man, a gay man that is conservative. You know, probably thinking, Candace, there's no such thing as a gay man that is conservative. But yes, in fact, there are a bunch of gay conservatives that do not have sex, right? So they acknowledge that they are gay, but they believe that it is the act of sodomy that the Bible condemns. And this individual is a gay Christian who goes to church every Sunday, probably more than that. And he says, you know, I do not engage in sexual relations as a gay man. And I found that to be fascinating. And I spoke further with him about that. And here's what he said to me, and trust me, I know this is going to sound ridiculous, but we're going somewhere here. He said, Candace, in my experience, of all of the gay people that I have met in the gay community, probably only 10% of them, maybe even less, are actually gay. I went, what? What do you, what do you mean only 10% of them are actually gay? He said, no, 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 I'm serious. About 10% of them, do I think, maybe even less, were actually born gay. The rest of them have other issues going on. He used himself as an example. He said, for me, and me as, a, as an example, I have daddy issues. I grew up without a father in the home. And for me, establishing a relationship, some sort of a relationship as a gay man makes me feel like I'm getting that love that I missed. He also intimated to me that a lot of other people had been molested when they were children, and they had various reasons for becoming a part of the gay community consciously, right? So they're choosing to be gay, but they weren't born gay, since that always seems to be at the crux of the debate. So he's saying that people are artificially becoming gay people because of various uh, experiences that they have had in the past. Now, this reminded me of that New York Post article that I keep talking about. I brought it up on yesterday's episode. We brought it up last week, episode 10. You can go take a listen to it. That talked about this phenomenon that's been happening of pseudo-trans kids, right? People that are not actually trans, but that are engaging online and just looking for some sort of a community. They're receiving so much content, right? They describe that content as digital toxins that are entering their brain. And they're just kind of picking any community, right? So for some people, that community is people that have disorders, right? They're pretending to be sick. They're pretending that they have bipolar disorder. Uh, and for other individuals, they are identifying and realizing that they can join a community by pretending to be trans. Now, this article that I'm mentioning, by the way, reminding you was written uh, by a psychologist, and more and more of these people are appearing um, uh, when they see them, and they're saying that they diagnose them as pseudo-trans, and then what they prescribe them is just time off of social media, and suddenly all of the symptoms they are presenting, like gender identity crisis, just kind of goes away, right? That's very interesting. The idea that some people may actually be suffering from gender dysphoria, but other people are suffering from something else, right? And they are pseudo-trans. This then reminded me of a sit-down interview that I did with a man named Walt Heyer. Walt Heyer is about 80 years old, and you should go pursue this conversation in its entirety. I still hold this to be the most important interview that I have ever given. And he talked about how he lived as a woman, went through with the bottom surgery uh, for almost 10 years of his life before he woke up one day and realized that it was an entire joke. So imagine he obviously is a male, he grew up and he suffered from gender dysphoria, and as soon as he went to the doctor, they gave him pills and they started him on this path of transitioning. He winds up in a hospital bed, uh, having removed his nether regions, and then years later just says, what am I doing? This is a joke. I'm now even more depressed. I'm now even more suicidal. And it's incredibly courageous that he does so much work today uh, with his charity, which is called Sex Change Regret, and talks about what he lived through. And in telling me his story, he says that he began to suffer from gender dysphoria at a very young age, 
because when he was just a toddler, his grandmother used to dress him up in a dress, this purple chiffon dress that he talks about. And she would give him all of this positive feedback, which is what kids look for. I know what he's talking about, of course, because I have a toddler. So when he puts on his sweater, I go, oh, you look so cute. You look amazing. And then he sort of looks looks like this, and, and, my, and my kid will stand to the side and sort of take in the compliment and know that that means that he did something good because we are applauding him and we're smiling. So imagine for Walt Tyre, the something good that he did was put on a purple chiffon dress, right? And his grandmother gave him that positive feedback. And then it culminated that his uncle at the time molested him, right? So this is a child that was sexually abused by a relative. And when he went to tell his parents about this sexual abuse, they didn't necessarily believe him. And it was a lot of drama to go through at such a young age. But you can imagine, as Walt Heyer describes, that it led him to this gender dysphoria. So he wasn't born with gender dysphoria, but this dysphoria was created by his environment and by his circumstances. And rather than getting the help that he needed, right, rather than having a psychologist say to him, hey, did you go through something that is making you want to get rid of your identity? Did you, did some, did you experience something? He was just given pills. And, and it led, obviously, uh, to a devastating, what I refer to as mutilating your own body, right? He went through with this procedure because everyone kept telling him, yes, 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 and nobody looked beneath the surface. A fascinating concept, by the way, which you can apply to other categories. For example, the TLC show, My 500-Pound Life, I believe that's the title of it. Often, when you get into the stories of these individuals who are so obese they can't get out of bed, and you go, how on earth? Could any person become this obese? How on earth could any person allow themselves to eat their way to this? Well, what's bubbling under the surface is a trauma. Many of them in the episodes that I watched were also sexually abused. It's a different way to wrench yourself of your identity. Some of the women will say, well, I was molested when I was a child, and so what I did was I started putting on the pounds so that men would never look at me an identity crisis. And fortunately, with these individuals, we acknowledge that it is an illness, right? We acknowledge that their association with food is toxic, and the show aims to actually help them make their lives better. So back to the the question that I'm getting at here is, is it plausible that American society artificially is creating gay and lesbian and trans people? Are all of them actually gay and lesbian? Let's start there. Are all of them actually even gay and lesbian? I think in order to answer that question, we'd have to go back and we'd have to look at the 90s. In the 90s, it was a very particular decade in which there sort of was this explosion of these culturally iconic moments in which people were coming out and saying, I'm a lesbian or I'm gay. And it got a lot of attention in the media and these individuals were celebrated, right? As just one example, Melissa Etheridge, she is a singer And she was singing at a Bill Clinton inauguration party when she announced that she was, in fact, a lesbian. Take a listen. My sister, Katie Lang, has been such an inspiration and such the greatest thing I've ever seen this year. This obviously meant a lot to individuals around the country who perhaps were suffering and were in the closet and were feeling that they had no cultural people in the public space to talk about uh, same-sex attraction. She wasn't the only one, by the way, in the 90s. Of course, maybe even more notably was Ellen DeGeneres. Ellen DeGeneres came out on her show and she said that she was gay and then she was given uh, a time cover. Here is the cover of Time magazine, and the title of it is, Yup, I'm Gay. And it's Ellen Generous, and she's smiling. And you can imagine, by the way, uh, that if you were a person and you were taking in this content and you were reading Time magazine and then you watched Ellen Generous' show, she is one of the most likable people during her show. She's fun. She's amazing. And if you're a person and you're thinking, oh, maybe I'm a lesbian, what an amazing lesbian icon to have to follow, right? Everybody likes Ellen Generous. Everybody loved her her show. I still enjoy snippets from Ellen Generous's talk show, and she became one of the most popular hosts. 
Not mentioned, however, and I am not trying to draw conclusions for either of these women, but both of these women have also talked about the fact that they were sexually abused when they were younger. Before they found fame, they went through periods of sexual abuse. Is it related? It's understandable, I suppose. Of course, it's understandable that if you had been harmed by an individual of a certain sex, that you would shy away from all healthy sexual relations with that particular sex. But is that the right thing, right? Instead of acknowledging that these people have been harmed and trying to help them, we now have a society that just celebrates it. They just say, oh, this is completely normal. It's just this, everything that you're feeling is completely normal and it's completely valid. And buried beneath could be an individual that is hurt, that is still hurting, and that would make different decisions if people reached in and helped them. But we can't talk about that because that would be, I guess, gay conversion therapy, right? Which has all of these dark medieval tones, according to the internet, according to leftists. Again, I don't have any answers to these questions. I think that it is worthy of discussion. It is worthy of deep consideration. Are we now in a society where we are seeing a higher incidences of individuals identifying as various things. In fact, now there's people that are identifying as animals and as cats and as dogs because there is a suffering underneath that we are not acknowledging. That's my only question. That's all I have to say about that. Okay, guys, before we continue, I want to talk to you about Front Page Magazine. Front Page Magazine was founded by conservative writer David Horowitz, and they have spent over two decades combating the radical left's efforts to destroy America. Their two new podcasts, The Right Take with Mark Tapson and The Jason Hill Show, offer riveting interviews and insightful coverage of politics, culture, and current events. It takes a village to combat the radical left's efforts to destroy America. That's why, as a fan of my show, you should also check out these guys over at Front Page Magazine by visiting frontpagemag.com. And while you're there, you can support their cause by making a tax-deductible donation. Inside every progressive is a totalitarian screaming to get out, and no one understands that better than the team over at Front Page Magazine. Go check out frontpagemag.com today. Okay, now it's time for some topics du jour. I want to start with Hayden Penetier. In case you guys don't know who Hayden Penetier is, she is an actress, and I'm going to remind you why you do know her. Honestly, I think her best work, Remember the Titans. Such a good movie. Back when we used to have productive conversations about race and it felt like America was all together and recognizing the harms of the past and wanting to move forward into an actually progressive future. Yeah, Hayden Panettiere played the um, child. Remember the blonde girl who was so likable and helped her dad coach and remember the Titans? That is who she played and now she's done a lot more. She's on a TV show that's called Nashville. But I want to talk about this a cultural moment where she appeared on Red Table Talk. Red Table Talk is a talk show uh, that is run by Jada Pinkett Smith, Will Smith's toxic wife. And the reason why I want to discuss it is because I often bring up this idea that I feel is penetrating American society that makes manhood obsolete. No matter what, the man is wrong. No matter what, the man can do no good in a relationship. And I had followed Hayden Penetier on her spiral. She had a public spiral. And the reason why uh, I followed her is because it was interesting at the time when I was pregnant to consider that perhaps this woman began this spiral because she suffered a very traumatizing birth. So Hayden Penetier, she's a very small person, and she came out in interviews after she gave birth and basically said that her child tore her apart on the way out and it caused postpartum depression, which it's very real. For women, I want to say this very clearly, I felt so sad for Hayden Panettiere. It was obvious that she was struggling. She was putting herself into rehab more than one time. She went to rehab to deal with postpartum depression. She felt like her body wasn't her own. I mean, those even those moments of sadness, whether or not we're being extreme and always referring to that depression, it is so natural. You're, it's such a period of adjustment for women. You just give birth. You either have your first child and your entire life kind of uh, has to change and it shifts. Your body is not your own, by the way. If you're 
breastfeeding, it's not your own. If you're not breastfeeding, you feel guilty about the fact that you're not breastfeeding. I mean, there are a lot of what I believe to be natural, understandable emotions that women go through after they give birth, despite the fact that being able to have children, have family, it's a wonderful miracle and it's something that we should never take for granted. So I was particularly interested in this Hayden Penetier story because so many things seemed to go wrong for her after this. She checked herself into rehab, as I mentioned prior, a few times, and she began struggling by her, she's admitting this, by the way, began struggling with substance abuse issues. Now, at the time, she was married uh, actually, I think that they were just engaged. Her ex-partner was Vladimir Klishko. You may recognize that name uh, because he is Ukrainian and he is involved in Ukrainian politics. And he's a boxer, a world-renowned boxer. So at the time, she was with him. And because she was struggling with these various substance abuse issues and because she was in and out of rehab, she eventually signed over full custody of Kaya, that's her little girl, to him. And that was in 2018. But now, in this Red Table Talk interview, she is claiming that it wasn't really a mutual agreement to do so. And she felt that Kaya was just going to go over and visit him in Ukraine like she always did. But once the little girl got to Ukraine, uh, Klishko told her that he wanted full custody. So she's painting a picture like she wasn't in a good place she goes off to rehab, and Klishko kind of convinces her to sign some papers and ends up with full custody. Take a listen of what she, to what she actually said on Red Table Talk. I also remember her dad calling me, and he said, Kaya's going around and asking other women if she can call them mommy. <gasps> and my, like, breath hitched, and, and wow, my heart so stopped. Cool. And he was laughing. He thought this was funny, and it was horrifying to me. He didn't get it as it was to me who saw, you know, that's a trauma reaction. Yeah. I mean, as much as I have tried to explain yeah. how much she needs her mom and how it's going to rear its ugly head mm. later when she's older and it could turn into anger, yeah. depression, sadness, whatever it is, but it's going to be a trauma. I thought this yeah. was an agreement that you came to, that you felt it was best that your daughter be with her dad? At first it was not because it wasn't a discussion. Okay. It wasn't, if he had come to me and said, um, you know, I think because of where you're at right now and the struggles that you're having, it would be good for her to, you know, be over here with me for mm -hmm. a while. Right. To which I probably, if I had had enough of a conversation, would have said, Okay, that that makes sense. I get it. I'll come there, if, you know, to visit and and mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Because of the way that it was done, it was very upsetting. I mean, it was the worst signing those papers it was like the most heartbreaking thing I've ever ever had to do in my life. So you get it. It's a bunch of women sitting around feeling very bad for her because she's lost custody of her daughter, Kaya, but she also signed the papers. So it's not exactly like she didn't know that she was going to lose her daughter, but she paints it as if she didn't, as she just thought she was going to go to Ukraine like she always does, but now realizes that, no, I actually signed over uh, full custody. And this is really wrong. This is a really bad cultural moment because first and foremost, they should have pushed back on her. The story makes no sense. She's saying that Kaya already used to frequent Ukraine, which means that young Kaya has a passport. I know this, obviously, because my children have a passport and they frequent England to see the rest of, to see their father's side of the family, right? You need both parents present to get a passport. You don't need post -parent, both parents present to then travel thereafter, meaning that if my husband wants to get on a plane right now with my son and go to the UK, he can do that. So why did Vladimir Klitschko, after her daughter already had a passport and had visited Ukraine multiple times, why did he suddenly bring her papers? Clearly, she must have known that these papers weren't just to grant her what she already had, access to Ukraine. Clearly, they were going through a situation in which she was struggling by her own account of substance abuse issues. She was in rehab. And he did something that is, in my opinion, heroic, okay? He took care of the little girl. He understood that his, the mother was not in a good mental space, right? At the time, she was choosing 
to abuse substances over choosing to raise her child. Again, that is not to make it seem as though I am not sympathetic to what she went through. I do honestly believe her and her account of what happened. But she was going through a tough time. Here is what she was going through. Ready? In October of 2015, she checked into a treatment facility battling postpartum depression following the birth of her first child. In May 2016, she returned to treatment. Recently, in case you're thinking, well, that's years ago and you can understand that now she may want to be more a part of her daughter's life. Recently, in May of this year, she was involved in a fist fight outside of a restaurant with her boyfriend. I don't know if this is still her boyfriend. His name is Brian Hickerson. He had been arrested for domestic abuse against her recently. He was on probation. And if you go and you pursue the clip, you will find her and her husband getting into an altercation outside of a restaurant in California this year. Right, The cameras are running, and allegedly, it's being alleged that her boyfriend spit on a patron inside, and this led to a brawl outside. And as she's jumping in the brawl and trying to pull her boyfriend out of the circumstance, she's saying to him over and over again, jail, Brian, jail, Brian, jail, because she's reminding him that he is on probation for domestic violence. And that if he gets arrested again for this brawl, he's going to get a a straight ticket back to prison, right? So it is, to me, a PR move for these women to sit around in a circle and to pretend like this was a story from a long time ago in which Vladimir Klitschko took advantage of her. It's not. This is a woman who is struggling for real reasons, right? But who is still struggling to create a safe environment for her child. Now, I understand how Hollywood works. She probably called her PR agent. She is probably trying to repair her public image, and all of that is aspirational, and all of those things are good. But what is more aspirational and what is even more good is the fact that there is a man who, despite how difficult it is early on for men to be a part of, you know, the infant stage when really the infant just needs its mother. It just needs milk. Uh, You will, when you get married, if you are married and listening to this, you understand this. If you have children, uh, men don't really know what to do in those early days. They're confused. Despite all of this, Vladimir Klitschko stepped to the plate and he saved his daughter from an erratic household. Yes, he took her to Ukraine, but it is a great injustice not to acknowledge this heroic feat. Yes, it is true what she is saying. Children need their mothers, but they also need mothers that are stable. And they also need their fathers, fathers that are willing to step to the plate, as Vladimir Klitschko did, if their children need help. Up next, I want to talk to you guys about this headline. Why can't gay or lesbian twins have sex with or marry each other? Why is incest wrong between same-sex siblings? Of course, we were going here in society. This is common sense to me that we are going here in society. I covered this last week in telling you that pornography is now insisting on an incestuous uh, conversation. We visited the links, remember, of Pornhub.com, and I read them out loud. They were despicable, but virtually every link was incest, right? Almost incest, I should say. It was stepbrother does this with his stepsister or stepmom does this with her stepson, which of course is now something that is entering the minds of individual. And you can see this even in advertisements on Instagram. Something that I've noticed as just one conversation is that the Kardashian sisters, whenever they promote a product, they are half naked, and they are with each other, and they are touching almost literally up against each other's crotches. It's a very strange thing. I have two sisters. Never in my life would I get down to my underwear and seductively hold my sister while her legs are open, but these are the ads that are appearing now for, I don't know, lipstick. If you want to buy my lipstick, take this this, uh, image of me and my sister holding the product close to each other's mouths, close to each other's bosoms, close to each other's private parts, and somehow that should make you want the product more. So I almost feel like there is this seeding of incest that is happening in American society, and I'm not sure why, and I'm not sure who is behind it. But yes, this article is real. It exists. It's from 2018, though I want to make that clear. So here is just one quote from that article. Some argue that between consenting adults— or the same or a similar age, incest is a victimless crime. 
That is, of course, providing they don't reproduce. So between twins of the same sex, where there are no gray areas regarding consent or abuse, and there's absolutely no chance that either will conceive, why not? We wouldn't like to say, but it's an interesting theory. That said, in the interest of fairness and equality, if gay or lesbian siblings, twins, fall in love and are legally allowed to marry or have sex, it's not really fair if straight siblings and twins aren't given the same rights just because some of them can reproduce. Where would the line be drawn? What if both siblings were infertile? It's a minefield, though probably one that will be discussed more in the future. Well, I agree with that last quotation that it will be discussed more in the future. It's obvious that that is where this society is headed. And in this article, they're trying to debate both sides of it. Like, what's the problem? Who cares if you're sexually attracted to your sibling? It's not really a big deal as long as you don't go as far as having children because we know that there are implications uh, that things can go wrong genetically if you uh, reproduce with your loved one. And as I always say, it is particularly something to pay attention to on social media. Things are becoming more and more perverse and they are being sold sold to us as elements of diversity. It's not diversity, it is just perversity. Protect your ears and protect your eyes. Speaking of protecting your ears and protecting your eyes, There's the actress Chloe Grace Moretz, and she recently came out and said that a meme that mocked her body actually contributed to her having body dysmorphia and that she became a recluse. Chloe Grace Moretz spoke bluntly to Hunger Magazine about becoming reclusive after her body dysmorphia was exacerbated by a horrific meme, pardon, on social media, most notably one that compared her body to a Family Guy character. Uh, I'm showing you the image now, and you can see it, and it brought to her a lot of ridicule. The Family Guy, by the way, produced this character, not meaning for it to be her, but people saw it on social media and snapped a side-by-side of her walking in a hotel, carrying a pizza box. Then she just had the onslaught of memes of people throwing it to her about her body, and she had never really spoken about it publicly but it affected her and it made her not really want to go out and be seen anymore, whereas before she felt more confident. This goes back to the discussion that we had on yesterday's podcast about developing a psychological immune system. You know, Chloe Grace Moretz is in her early 20s and she has been in the public eye since she was quite young. And I do believe that it is a dangerous game to allow teenagers to engage in social media before their brains are developed or until rather they are sure-footed, until they are sure of who they are, until their values are established, you really are playing with a weapon. It's already difficult being a teenager as it is, and it is increasingly more difficult to be a teenager in this world of social media harassment. I want to jump into this next story because it is so not surprising at all, unless you're an idiot and you haven't been paying attention to the fact that we have been defrauded and that we have had people in government that have defrauded us. Doesn't it seem weird that the person that locked us down during the time of COVID, nobody, you couldn't go to work, Don't go to work, wear a mask, save lives, stay inside. You're being called upon to stay indoors. It's very easy. Don't make a living for you or your children. This is so simple. Just stay inside. Why do you want to make money? Why do you want to put food on your table? I think that was kind of what we all got from Dr. Fauci, who was telling us how bad the virus was going to be. Yeah, it was a social media virus that was really bad. It was a traumatizing media that kept insisting that we were all going to die. But the statistics completely defied that, completely defied that narrative. Didn't matter. You needed to stay home and you needed to go broke. But Fauci, mm, not so much. It turns out, according to a Daily Wire headline, that Fauci made a lot of money during the pandemic. Dr. Anthony Fauci's net worth soared during the COVID pandemic, leaving the career government worker sitting on nearly $13 million nest egg, according to newly uncovered documents. The 81-year-old director of the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases added some $5 million to his household net worth 
from 2019 to 2021, according to financial disclosures that were obtained by OpenTheBooks.com. The federal government's highest paid employee, including the president, earns $480,000 per year. Wow, that is a lot of money to be made. One way in which he made that money, by the way, was that he was awarded a $1 million prize by the Israel-based Dan David Foundation for, quote, speaking truth to power. Oh, wow, a $1 million prize. I feel like I'm speaking truth to power right now. Can I get a $1 million prize? Probably not, because we know this is shady. We know that deals are done behind the scenes. We know there was a reason that they were pushing this vaccine, and the reason was because it garnered a lot of money for a lot of people, none of them being the American people, none of them being the regular citizens who had the carpet ripped from under their feet, who depleted their entire savings accounts and then were told to feel ashamed if they wanted to go out and get a job. We're told, you're a bad person if you don't want to sit home and go broke. Don't worry, the government's going to take care of you by giving you a couple of hundred dollars to make up for this. Yeah. That's what we were told, right? Well, Fauci, fortunately, is not a part of the average American people. Fauci is a part of the people that collude medically to keep people, in my opinion, in the dark. It is making people more and more sick and more and more, of course, dependent upon the government. How's that for government corruption? Yep, that's all I have to say about that. All right, guys, the next portion of the show is going to be available exclusively on Daily Wire Plus. I'm going to be talking about my thoughts on adoption as well as the gentle parenting craze. So if you're not a member yet, go ahead and click the link in the description and subscribe right now.